All right, what I want to talk about today is uh, what I term business agility. And what I mean by business agility is the ability for any business, or in our instance in the profession, a firm, to stay up to date with current trends, how the world actually is today. And what I want you to understand as we go through it this morning is that it's a very different world. The world you knew a couple of years ago, frankly, does not exist anymore. And you need to think about that related to your clients. So I'm going to talk about that in general. I'm going to talk about the speed of adoption today versus how it was a couple of years ago. And then I'm going to compare businesses that, in fact, are agile versus those that are not agile. And then I'm going to give you some information about our behavior these days, how we've changed in the last couple of years as consumers. Hopefully, you'll, you'll come away with a little bit of knowledge about what I mean about being agile in today's world, and also a little bit of trivia about the types of things that we're doing today. It's kind of interesting. Then I'm going to follow that up with where the profession is. I've done this at the last couple of conferences to give you some information on our survey. And you think about how you relate to that. And by the way, when I run through that, I hope I don't insult anyone. I'm just trying to provide data. And by the way, those of you that haven't been to my sessions, you will understand that I like data. You're going to see a lot of data this morning. And then after that, I'm going to give you a demo of some of our newer technology, and we'll close with that. So with that, let me get started. As I mentioned, the pace of technological change is accelerating at an unprecedented rate today. Sometimes we don't even think about it, but we hear about things, and often you, you, you uh, hear about major things that are changing, and you're not necessarily putting it all together. Rapidly developing technologies are converging today, everywhere. And I'm going to show you a couple of videos to have you understand this and just relate it to our world today versus a few years ago. As we compare this with the past, the telephone was invented in the 1880s, yet we didn't have the infrastructure available for it to be out to the masses until about the 1920s. TVs replaced, replaced radio as a medium of choice in the 1950s, yet televisions were being produced as early as the 1920s. We couldn't adopt that new technology. It took seven years for the global sales of PCs cumulatively to reach one million units, depending upon when you start that clock. Most people think that was about 1979. Cumulative sales, seven years. Think about that as we compare some numbers from, from today. It's very different today. The world that you understood just a couple of years ago doesn't exist. And frankly, that's when businesses get in trouble is when they're misaligned with the world of today and how they operate their business, or in this example, the firm. The mobile web computing phase is by far the fastest and most disruptive of the computing phases that we've had to date. We have mainframe computers, mini computers, microcomputers, the desktop web, and the mobile web. And by the way, I want to tell you this is not a presentation necessarily about the mobile web. That's not really what it's all about. What it's all about is consumer behavior and how we've changed over the years and that we need to understand that and bring that into our practices. The mobile web really started in about 2007, and obviously the driving force was the smartphone initially and then the tablet, following that up. Apple introduced their iPhone in 2007. We had smartphones prior to that, didn't we, like the Blackberry and others. But those, in fact, we thought of really for email, texting, very little else. Apple comes out, and all of a sudden, the concept of the phone changed. It wasn't a, just a phone anymore. We had apps available with it. We could do many, many different things. The world changed at that point. I should go back one. Never mind. <laughs> all right. What I was going to comment on is Apple Actually, when they released the iPhone, they sold 74 million units, excuse me, um, a million units in 74 days. The Android was released shortly thereafter, the operating system. We started seeing Droid hardware out there. 
And Droid actually sold at six times what the iPhone initially did in the first uh, 16 quarters. 2010, Apple releases the iPad. All of a sudden, the mobile web accelerates. It goes into hyper growth at that point. A million units, 28 days, two million units in 60 days. 7.3 million units in the last quarter of 2010 during the holiday season, which is typically when these types of devices peak. Incredible adoption rate. A relatively new computing phase entered at that point. Hyper growth. Things started moving much, much faster. Again, let's do a couple of comparisons here. The iPod, released uh, 12 years ago, was a reimagination of music. All of a sudden, we didn't have to get a CD with 10 songs we didn't like and you know one or two that we thought were good. The concept of music totally changed. And when that was introduced, stunning initial sales of that product. They were flying off the shelves. In comparison, in the first 10 quarters after initial launch, the iPhone sold at 11 times iPad, iPod shipments, and the iPod, iPad following that up at three times the iPhone shipments. All right, where are we today overall this summer? This is data from surveys this summer. Percent of US adults now that own smartphones is at 58%. So very significant growth over the past few years. Tablets at 38%. Think about within your own practice. How are you interacting with your clients? Are you using tablets? Are you operating as an agile firm of today? Another piece of data that's interesting, 56% of those with annual incomes over 75,000 own tablets as of August of this year. Think about that as it relates to your practice. Tablet market has been exploding. 87 million units were expected to be shipped through the end of this year. 227 million units on a global basis. What happened in September of this year? New generation of iPhones. Apple sold 9 million units in a three-day period. Now, you're all accountants. You're probably wondering, what does that 9 million units translate to in terms of dollars? You did the math on the average price, and by the way, Apple gets full price, not what you pay through your carrier. They get full price from that carrier of the product. They sold, uh, again, your accountants, you'll appreciate that, a single product from a single company, almost eight, uh, $6 billion in overall revenue in three days. In 2017, IDC, a major research firm, estimates that we'll be shipping over 400 million units now relate that to the initial seven years on the PC, cumulative sales, one million units. The tablets, 400 million units plus, being sold in a single year, not cumulative. The world's changing. All right, what's next? Where are we going next? The internet today is very, very big. And as a matter of fact, I won't get into the technical terms, but it had to be expanded a few years ago because it couldn't handle the number of devices connecting. Today, we're at about 8.1 billion devices, which is more than the people on Earth. Many of us have multiple devices all connected to the web. Very soon, it's going to get much, much bigger because we're headed into this new wave of the mobile web. Cisco estimates 40 billion devices will be connected by 2020. We're in a different world today, and it's changing very rapidly. A lot of people call the world we're in today the post-PC era. We had desktops, notebooks. Now we've got smartphones and tablets. Where is it going tomorrow? We're entering this new phase or extension of the mobile web called wearable. Now, I don't know if Google Glass is going to make it. Um, there are a few things about it that trouble me, but I will tell you the concept definitely is there and it's coming, and it's starting very rapidly. Wearable devices, by the way, have been selling at uh, twice their prior monthly rate for the last year, and that's expected to continue to expand. As this started really this year. There's going to be accelerating very shortly. So let's think about where, where we've been. And I would tell you, people talk about the cloud. Accounting firms talk about the cloud. 
cloud was 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Many applications were available in the cloud. Ours have been available since the late 90s. There's nothing new about that necessarily, but you should think about it related, related to your practice. Because one of the things that occurred is mobile came along. So cloud was anywhere, anytime. Mobile was anywhere, anytime, any device. And that started a few years ago. And what mobile did was actually, because people started putting things in the cloud, lifted the, the cloud overall and the acceptance rate um, continued to, again, accelerate. It's much faster today. So the way I think about last year and this year and next year is last year was a year of mobile where we entered that hyper growth period and we've been in that for a while. 2013, the year of the tablet and the tablet sales will start slowing down. That's a typical adoption curve. That's the way things operate. 2014 will be the internet of things is what's referred to as uh, by technologists. We're gonna see a whole bunch of new forms out there and it will be, we've, reach this new level, anywhere, anytime, any device, any user interface. That's the world we're entering right now. So in the past, we had a keyboard and a mouse, a graphical user interface. Now, in the mobile world, we're entering this new arena, which is touch, voice, gesture, natural user interfaces. Now, I see this, again, even with my, my kids, where the young ones that are now seven, their interaction with touch devices is very interesting to observe. They get it. I'll also tell you that I'm, I'm a fan of Windows uh, 8. I think Microsoft actually nailed it with Windows 8 with that new interface. A lot of us have trouble with it because it's so very different. But it's touch, it's swipe, a much different interface. One of the things that troubles me, I actually have a, um, a Microsoft Surface Pro and one of the things that troubles me now is I occasionally have to hit the home button on my iPad. I hate it because it slows me down. It's different. We're entering this different area. So I'm going to show you a couple of illustrations here of what our world is like today. This first one, by the way, was um, initially um, taped three years ago. All of these products, by the way, are at least in a prototype mode at this point. We're going to start seeing some flexible devices. Heck, we're not even going to get out of bed when we work on a tax return, are we? So we'll have flexible devices. These are in prototype. Uh, many products are available in prototype currently. How would you like to be sending messages about, I've got a completed tax return to your client while she's brushing her teeth. <laughs> By the way, if I have any of you do my personal tax return, please, I want a little more attention to it, and I want you doing it while you're brushing your teeth, all right? Every surface is going to be a user interface in the very near future. Your desk will be possibly a table in a restaurant. You'll be interfacing with a computer on the web connected to those 40 billion devices, one of those 40 billion devices. We have monitors and prototypes now that have that flip capability for working in offices. It's a different world we're in today. Things are moving and accelerating at a very, very rapid pace. You know we have the capability of picking up um, through droids in particular information off of another device just by being close by. Motion is also in play today. And this is an illustration of that. Where you don't even have to touch a device. You think we're in a different world today? You think it's different than what we knew just a couple of years ago? And we're not done yet. Eye control. Very interesting technology. We actually have one of these I devices in development. We'll connect to your laptop over here. And what you can do with this is be able to navigate your desktop just by looking at it. So we're already calibrated. We'll go over to the desktop just to give you an idea of how this works. 
So I'm just looking at desktop and I launch that. So you can see here the eye control right there as I move my head around. So if I go back out to the main menu, all I have to do is look at an application I want to launch in order and then press this blue button right here. So as I said, we've got this technology we're looking at because we obviously have to be concerned about, you as a technology company, user interfaces. Where are they going? What's happening? What's happening next? As a matter of fact, what actually is happening next is there are studies that are going on about um, how people's behavior and what they're looking at on a screen, what they're, the, the computer can actually determine your next move and be able to um, move based on that, perform the next action. All right, what does all this mean to me? John, you've talked about driverless vehicles, we've got robotics. What it means is that consumer behavior is being impacted by all of these things, and that's the outside world, and we need to think about it as it relates to our inside world. Everything has changed today, just in the last couple of years, and been reimagined. Cloud mobile converging technologies have created shifts in consumer behavior and expectations that we've not seen in the past. And by the way, consumers is where it's all at. We have to understand that as we're running accounting firms because we serve people. It's not business as usual anymore. We need to be operating or think about operating in a totally different mode. Now, creative destruction is a term used by economists. It really refers to fits and starts in the economy based upon new innovations. And creative destruction can actually create situations where products and services potentially are designed for a world that no longer exists. And this is what I would like you to think about while you're out here for the next couple of days. Are you operating, providing services in a manner that really the world has moved on? And I'm sure that sitting at your table, you can think of many examples of this. Now, rapid adoption is a key to business agility. and ensures that the products and services are aligned to meet the needs and constraints of customers, clients of today, or partners. Now, all of this started really with a digital age and online as a fundamental shift, and then came mobile. With digital and online, some businesses rose and others, others actually fell. Now, as you look at this chart and as you think conceptually about what has occurred, um, people say, well, just it's the Internet. That's what the issue was. Well, I would say, no, the Internet wasn't the issue. It certainly was the driving force. But the issue was consumer behavior. We started to change our behavior. And suddenly, these businesses were misaligned. They missed it. They weren't agile enough, some of them, to move along with where the world was today. That inability to be agile is what caused many of these companies to fall down. What you should think about, or what I would ask you to contemplate, is consumers are clients. And they're seeing all this activity in the outside world, and they're expecting us to move along with it. They have very different behavior today, and their expectations have dramatically changed. We want things as consumers, all of you do, now, instant. You expect response, that's the world in which you live, and that's what you expect to deal with. We interact with people and devices differently than we did just a few short years ago. The average US adult today spends 141 minutes using a mobile device, 141 minutes. They access their smartphone approximately 150 times per day. Do the math on average waking hours, how often people are looking at their smartphones. Think about that as, how, as far as how it might impact your practice. Now, when you think about this 150 interactions, by the way, this is where wearable devices come into play. Because wearable devices will, in many instances, not all, eliminate that necessity to pull out something and interact with it because you're going to have a wearable device. That's why this is going to accelerate very rapidly. All right, how do we use smartphones in the course of the day? Well, we actually, to some degree, it's the second item on the list. We actually use them to make telephone calls, phone calls. That's 22 times, but we use them for messaging, music, gaming. We use it as a camera, an alarm, uh, alerts, our calendar, many different things that we use our mobile devices for. In today's world, we're either scanning, 
prices, nutrition. I don't like that one, by the way. It makes me think about uh, the fact that uh, I'm getting a little heavier. Other information, other data, or being scanned, or being scanned here. Payments, rewards, ticketing, boarding passes. Now think, this world is no different than your clients and what they're going through. Everything today has been reimagined. I could probably put 100 things on a screen here, but these are just a few examples that are very different in today's world. Photography, we use a smartphone. Cameras are pretty much a thing of the past. Um, car service, how we order car service today with the apps that we have available to us like Uber and there are many competitors out there where you used to have to call up, make a reservation, make sure you did it in advance. If you had any change, you got an issue with it. If you live in a major city today, you simply get on your mobile device, you bring up Uber, it tells you where the vehicles are that are connected with Uber right near your vicinity, allows you to book one of those vehicles um, and pay it, pay for it immediately. Signatures are all electronic. Hopefully the IRS gets through that process and we'll see that related to tax returns, but at some, at some point that's clearly going to occur. Files and folders, we've moved everything up to the cloud today. We've got iCloud, we've got Amazon's versions, we've got Microsoft's versions, we've got Dropbox, various other methods that we're dealing, again, we've pushed things to the cloud. The loan process is very different today. We've got crowdfunding. Rather than applying for a loan, we can do crowdfunding with respect to any type of loan whatsoever today. And also, if you've got a great idea, instead of hitting the venture capitalist firms um, uh, or private equity firms, you can simply go out and get funding with your app. Home management, many examples of this. Probably many of you are using this. We can uh, lock and unlock your garage door, lift your garage door automatically from wherever you are in the world. This is an illustration of a lock, which you can have on your home and allow you to do things like if someone needs to come into your house and you're not home, give them a specific code for one period of time, allow them in and out, and the house is locked. We monitor our temperatures. We can have smoke detectors all related to our mobile devices. It's a different world today. 60% of North Americans currently use their phones for work. 200 million mobile workers will be using mobile business apps this year, 79% of people aged 18 to 44 have the smartphones with them 22 hours a day. And I will tell you the two hours they're not with them, they forgot about them, they left them on a table, left them on a counter or whatever. We are attached to these things. We hyperventilate when we don't have our smartphone around us, right? If you've ever lost one, you know what I'm talking about. 41% more smartphone users paid a bill through their smartphones last year than the year before. We don't carry checkbooks anymore. We're entering a cashless society. I will tell you that if you follow the digital payments world, it is probably the most active in terms of new technology than any area that I've ever seen. You're gonna see major changes in this area and obviously as accountants, you're gonna have clients dealing with this and you're gonna be giving them advice as to where they go from there. Now I'm getting into some of the bad uh, habits that we have today. Unfortunately, they're becoming acceptable. 30% of smartphone users check their phones during a meal with others. As I mentioned, you know, I've, I've got um, young kids, I've got the 16 year old. I tell them to leave the smartphone on a counter, whatever, when we're having dinner. You know that doesn't occur and they're simply looking down going, whatever. And they've gotten real good with one hand. So they, this is acceptable behavior these days. 24% of smartphone users check their phones while they're driving. Not a great thing to do. This one I found a little bit shocking. 9% of smartphone users check their phones during uh, services at a house of worship. Apparently that's when the sermon's getting a little dull. We'll check the scores from yesterday. Some of you may be even in a, a riveting keynote presentation actually looking at your smartphones right now. <laughs> I imagine that's entirely possible. 39% of smartphone users check their phones while using the bathroom, all right? As I said, our habits have changed and what was not acceptable a couple of years ago may very well be acceptable today. But that was last year. Now this is the interactive part of the session. A recent survey, what do you think the percentage was this year? I heard 65 here, that's pretty darn close, 75%. Our behavior, I think, has changed pretty dramatically. While we're on that topic, 
19% of smartphone users have dropped their phones in the toilet. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you again my own personal experience. with the, I've had this. I'm the guy that has to fish it out, by the way. Apparently, that's my job. Um, a couple of other experiences that we've had in my family is we lost a phone to a pedicure, you know, in the, in the basin. It's dropped in. My 16-year-old, um, at one point, we lost a phone. He was visiting a friend in his bathing trunks. He had his phone. He went in the hot tub. I would tell you, 15 minutes in a hot tub, the rice thing doesn't work. It's not going to dry out that sucker, all right? That one's highly suspect, by the way, because it happened to have been uh, very shortly after a new generation of the iPhone was released. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, was there something to that? By the way, 59% admit that they will fish the phone out. And one in three smartphone users say they'd rather give up sex than their phones. All right? So there's a large group here, law of averaging being what they are. Look to your left, look to your right. It's, it's one of you. Because I tell you, most people ask, that they'll, they'll actually go further on this question. They'll say, well, all right, for how long? All right? <laughs> this survey actually was for one week. Well, what would your response be? And that was done two years ago, by the way. I think it's actually changed and a little bit different today. We are very attached to these things. All right, YouTube reaches more US adults age 18 to 24 than any network whatsoever. If you don't think the networks needed to be agile actually a couple of years ago, I would challenge that assumption. They are thinking about how the heck they are gonna deal with this because adver advertising dollars are going elsewhere. We're an internet social sharing world today. Netflix and YouTube are responsible currently for 45% of internet traffic in the US. And YouTube uploads are growing from 40 hours per second two years ago to over 100 hours per second in 2013. We're a mobile society. 90%, an estimate by Cisco, 90% of all internet traffic will be video by 2017. I think the networks need to think about being a bit more agile. We're uploading and sharing photos at an unbelievable rate. This chart illustrates the daily number of photos being uploaded. Remember I said the mobile is driving the use of the cloud. Photos is a major part of that. We're now uploading today over 500 million photos per day into the cloud. And again, when you think about businesses and having to be agile, I will tell you on this chart, the light blue or the bluish color is Facebook. Facebook um, needs to be very agile with respect to some competitors out there. Instagram and Snapchat are coming into the mix and younger people use these pretty extensively. Face and what, what's desirable for them is that they're getting away from the ads that Facebook throws in your face, excuse the pun, constantly. So Facebook, I think, is going to be challenged long term. They're going to have to be agile and moving in a, in a slightly different direction. All right, social media. By the way, we've got a great shop, workshop on social media um, here at the conference telling you how to utilize it in your practice, what ideas that you might want to implement would be. And the only reason I illustrate this chart, actually, hopefully you can, you can see it right about in the middle is LinkedIn, which happens to be, for professionals, really the preferred social media. A lot of people jumping on board with it. It almost doubled between 2011 and, and 2012 in, in terms of usage. So you should be active in that area. Another thing that's occurring is 38% of children under the age of two, two, have used a mobile device. We're a different world today. We're almost, we're in a world where there are many generations now. Technologists refer to this. It isn't, you know, there's a, a significant difference between my seven-year-old's behavior with mobile devices and my 16-year-old's experience with mobile devices. And by the way, by the age of age eight, 78% of kids have used a mobile device. Incredible the world that we're in. But it's not just the young, is it? It's not just the young, which is, again, what you should consider in terms of your practice. The fastest growing age bracket on Twitter is 55 to 64 years old. I don't know why it's implied that's old. Um, I can't figure that one out. I happen to be in that demographic. And of course, and this is another interactive part of this, does anyone recognize this photo? 
All right, I will not mention any names, but this happens to be in a Senate hearing, which apparently was lasting quite a lengthy period of time, a senior senator whipped out his iPhone and started playing poker on it. You may remember that instance. It was a rather serious discussion that was going on, by the way. You know, the interesting thing is there was a little bit of outrage about this, but it blew over pretty darn quickly because we've changed. Not that it's necessarily acceptable. All right, small business owners, which you obviously are dealing with, 85% of them use smartphones in their operations. 66% state they would not survive without wireless. Do you have wireless in your office when they walk in? Are they able to get on right away? 69% use tablets in their business. And newer businesses started in the last two years, 80% use tablets in their business. When you're interacting with these clients, it might be a good idea to show you're on board with tablets. Different survey, question was asked, um, or comment, mobile solutions are critical for our business. 67% of small business owners either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. It's a different world today. Bottom line of all of this, disruptions are occurring at an incredible pace out there. All of our expectations have changed accordingly. So. Technology matters. Do more with more. It's to your benefit to think about implementing technology in your firms. All right, what does this rate of technological changes do to businesses that are not agile? Let's take a look at that side of the spectrum here. I mentioned it's a very different world today. Businesses or professions that don't have agility that are uh, in a world of products and services designed for a world that no longer exists, they simply go away, they die off. Over 40% of the companies in the Fortune 500 in 2000 are no longer there today. You're all accountants, you know it's a big number that's not there. You can think of many household names, Circuit City, um, Hollywood uh, uh, Video and Blockbuster, Dana, Kodak a number of companies that have disappeared. Kmart um, acquired, many companies acquired by other companies. U.S. Postal Service has many issues. I think we would all agree with that. But one of the major impacts that occurred to them was the numbers of pieces of mail delivered by the Postal Service has dropped in just a six year period from 250 million to 50 million. Our world is different today. We get our news very differently than we did a mere 10 years ago. We used to get newspapers, read about it. Today we think, wow, that's old news. Somebody had to actually package that up, print it, send it on out to us. It's different today. Um, we get our news through tweets. Uh, if you recall the news about the raid on uh, bin Laden's compound, we heard about it initially actually because somebody tweeted that, hey, it's kind of unusual at one o'clock in the morning for the helicopters to be cruising around uh, in, in the middle of the night. This is crazy. That's how we first heard about it. Again, I think um, many newspapers have been guilty about not being agile. They could have uh, worked their way through this, in my opinion, had they been agile. New York Times paid 1.1 billion for the Boston Globe 20 years ago. Does anyone ha want to hazard a guess? Some of you I know are from Boston, probably know this answer. What was paid for it this year? 100 million is the guess. That's pretty darn close. $70 million paid for by the Red Sox uh, owner, John Henry, for the Boston Globe. By the way, we, we come from, uh, at, uh, in the professional segment of business, we come from the Detroit area, so the Boston uh, Red Sox owner is not real popular with us. Right. In the third quarter of 2013, the PC market suffered through its 12th consecutive quarter of negative to single digit growth. As we look at tablets versus PCs, and there are a, a couple of variations on this estimate out there, the third quarter results just came out, but PC shipments down almost 9%. That's much better than the prior two years, by the way. They're making a bit of a recovery. Tablet shipments overall up 43%. Now, this chart is a little bit busy, and really what I want you to focus on with it, these are global tablet shipments, third quarter last year versus third quarter this year, as I mentioned, up 
about 227 million tablets will be sold overall this year. But a couple of things to point out here relative to business agility. If you look at the top, right under where it says global tablet market, you'll see the names of what are not typically top five PC vendors. You see Apple, which is a PC vendor, but not, not in the top five. They're really not a, a PC company, although they have that product. Samsung, you're seeing consumer companies in here. Asus, uh, Lenovo, and Acer are PC companies. They sell that hardware and have sold it for years, but if you look at the actual raw numbers related to them, they're quite small. PC manufacturers were not agile when they saw the world changing. Uh, and by the way, the other noticeable thing on this, the blue is, uh, happens to be Apple. You'll notice that they're relatively flat. The market share in the US is quite strong, but globally, this is, this is actually their share. This reflects that. Some of the newer players out there are Microsoft. I think a Surface is a good, great product, Surface Pro in particular, because it's got the full-blown Windows system on it. So you compare these players with Q3, five largest PC vendors. How would you like to be in that business today? Hurts a little bit. Acer and Asus with inexpensive products actually down almost 35%. HP and Dell, believe me, they're, doing, they're giving each other high fives because they're flat for the quarter. It was looking much different a while ago. Lenovo is the only one that's up and very, very slightly. They weren't agile as they saw the world changing. And of course, there's BlackBerry. But I would, I would argue there's much more to the story that uh, you see on the surface with BlackBerry. But let's look at the data. 2007, the share price, $225 a share. 2010, actually, this looks pretty darn good. We've got a US subscriber share of approximately 45%. Great. Where are we today? January U.S. subscriber share less than 5%. The latest data that I've seen on this is it's more like 2 or 3%. Current share price less than $8. I don't even know if the, if the share is worth anything today, actually, with what's going on with that, with that company. So as you step back and you look at it and you say, well, just wasn't just the smartphone itself or the iPhone itself that started this. They had core assumptions. And I will tell you, we all have core assumptions. We have core assumptions in Thomson Reuters. You have core assumptions in your firm. They were off literally everywhere. Technology, the concept of an ecosystem, their overall business model were off. As we look at it, and no one wrote these down, by the way, in BlackBerry. This was just the culture of BlackBerry. This was the mindset. Touch won't fly. Our keyboard is much better. People like the feel of that keyboard. Um, you know, again, in my own experience, I would tell you, I got the first generation iPhone, brought it home, showed it to my wife who had a Blackberry. She said, I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't deal with that touch thing. I said, Betsy, give it a chance. Why don't we get you an iPhone? We can, if you don't like it, we'll get you a Blackberry. I think it was two hours she was working with it. All of a sudden she said, I can't believe I even mentioned it to you that I wanted to stick with that keyboard. And obviously you have more real estate with the smartphone um, designed with touch. Small black and white screens are best. I think this was primarily tied to the next one, which is about Wi-Fi, but why the heck would you need color? I don't know why they didn't learn a lesson from PC monitors many years ago, but I think they didn't have the concept of apps down and the fact that we wanted color. Wi-Fi is expensive and hard to find. We know today that's in inaccurate. We're safe staying with the enterprise as the driver. This was probably the biggest single one. What they didn't realize in today's world, the consumers came. And what was occurring is consumers were going in saying, hey, keep your BlackBerry to their corporations. Keep your BlackBerry. I'm assuming the IT department can deal with uh, integrating with this particular device. And major corporations started bailing on BlackBerry because that was their key concept. We're OK in enterprises. Uh, carrier revenue sharing was golden and untouchable. Apple went in, totally turned this upside down. Everywhere their core assumptions were wrong. I think some of the, some of the things that we need to think about with respect to BlackBerry, first, constantly challenge core business assumptions. Think about your practice and what your assumptions may very well be and stay agile. Some possible 
accounting firm core assumptions. My clients aren't in the cloud. They don't necessarily want to be. Again, these may not be written in your firm, but you may think this way. My clients love my packaging, uh, my product. It's paper, those nice bound folders, everything looks great. Um, you know, in today's world, actually, technologists talk about people, and they dump them into two categories. They're either heavy or they're light. And what's happening is a lot of the heavy people, frankly, are going away. And what they mean by heavy people are things like, oh, this person likes physical things. They want to see a DVD. They want that physical feel of it. They like a book rather than getting a digital book. They like newspapers to spread them out, et cetera. Then you have light people who realize those tiny little devices, my mobile devices, I can have everything on that, and I'm lighter. These people may not even tell you, I don't want your packaging, but they may think it because they're light. Their world is um, very different than what you assume is their world. My clients love my personal interaction by phone or in person. I'm sure that they do, but they may want to deal with you differently in today's world because their behavior has changed related to that. Mobile is not important to my clients. I've given you some data on mobile. My product, this is a big one, is compilations, reviews, audits, tax returns, and general advice. I think in today's world, one thing we all should collectively think about is maybe today, because of the way consumers have changed, my product is how I service my end clients. And I'll give you, again, a personal example. I'm really irritated with my doctor right now. And the reason, and I've been with him 21 years since I moved to Ann Arbor, I've been with the same physician. He obviously literally knows me inside and out, all right? Understands me, all of my issues, et cetera. What I'm upset with him about, I think he was a little bit late with it, but he, he uh, implemented a portal about 14 months ago. And what I'm upset with is his office, it's not him, by the way, because I think he gets it. His office does not comprehend how to deal with his portal. So things like my prescription refills, et cetera, I utilize the portal and like nothing happens. I want to change appointments or make an appointment with my physician and nothing happens. I'm about ready to fire this guy, not because I don't like him, but because I'm sorry, I'm, I'm different today. I don't want to deal with my doctor this way. I don't want to call between 8.30 and 5 unless I want to talk to a nurse or the doctor themselves because I don't need to. And not only that, I don't need to deal with the hour they're off for lunch and they shut the darn phones off. All right, what I would challenge all of us to think about is that today, every accounting firm can do all of these things. What makes us different is are we serving our clients aligned with today's world? All right, those with business agility can actually thrive. Give you a couple quick examples of that. I'll set Apple aside. Apple pretty much dead in the late uh, 90s, uh, totally reimagined themselves and created brand new products. They were agile. They moved in a different direction. TomTom Tom and Netflix, a couple of other examples I'll just run through very briefly for you. TomTom Tom, um, was selling uh, portable personal navigation devices. Personal navigation devices peaked in terms of sales at 13 million in the fourth quarter of 2009 because what happened, we're obviously using our mobile devices now to navigate with. What, and I was one of the people, by the way, that predicted that Garmin and TomTom Tom would probably be out of business in a short period of time. I was wrong on that prediction. I would tell you, actually, TomTom Tom is doing very well today. What did they do? They were agile. They said they're in a great position. First of all, they have their own satellites. They can sell their mapping information to people. But where they really were starting to play now, as I said, there's more to this story, is they're, they're quite agile. They said, we have data. And that data are very valuable to a wide variety of business. In 2012, they had 5,000 trillion data points in their database describing time, location, direction, speed of travel of individual, and by the way, it's anonymous, um, users. You think that information might be valuable to businesses along their paths, how long they're um, staying at one place, moving to another, what other things are around them at that point. Location is a huge issue. They're doing exceptionally well. Um, they had 5 billion measurement points every single day. TomTom Tom is an example of an 
agile business. They're in big data, which I won't go into a great deal, but um, this is something that you're gonna see in your practice in the very near future. We're collecting, collecting data around literally everything today. The amount of data is exploding. From the beginning of recorded time until 2003, we created five billion gigabytes of data. In 2011, we created that same amount every two days. This year, that time will shrink to 10 minutes. And it's accelerating. Content on the internet tripled between 2010 and 2013. And IDC estimated back in 2009, is probably actually gonna be higher than this, we'll see a 44 times increase in data between 2009 and 2020. All right, Netflix, another example of a very agile business, totally disrupted the video rental business, right? Back in, uh, starting in 1997, all of a sudden they see the web the capabilities, order a DVD through the web, we'll utilize the postal service, you'll get your DVD the next day. Where are we today? Everything is on demand. Netflix saw this, projected it. They're agile. They didn't stick with what they were doing in the past. They are now a streaming TV network service and streaming on demand movie provider. Now it remains to be seen, it's a very crowded area, by the way, lots of people in this business. Whether they'll be successful, but I don't know if you've seen their stock price lately, they're doing very, very well. Uh, and they're a subscription model, which is great for this. They have 40 million subscribers overall, about 30 million in the U.S. and expanding elsewhere. They're an agile business. All right, what about us accountants? Are we agile? I'm sure you feel like that cheetah right here, raring to go in the conference here and get uh, reared up to, to move on. You know, are we keeping up and providing services aligned with today's world? Let's step back for just a minute here and talk about um, where we stand today as a, as a profession. We're feeling good, actually. We're seeing some encouraging new growth trends. It's not like the recession years overall. And I know this is a very progressive group. I'm sure you're all doing very well, and you're into new technology. At the Rosenberg survey from uh, last year, we started seeing growth in 2011, 2012, we're seeing much stronger growth overall um, in their survey respondents, which tends to be um, medium sized to a little bit larger firms, 5.4% overall growth. The very large firms, extremely strong growth. But what I would advise you is be careful because when we're in the comfort zone and we're feeling good, we might feel like Blackberry did back in 2008 and 2009. We're comfortable, we're growing. That subscriber rate was outstanding. That's where we are today is really the big issue is relevance. You know, thinking about our practices and, and relevance. Clients don't necessarily go to accountants for technology advice. They should, we know it, we're good at it. We advise a wide range of clients. clients can do things on their own or think that we can. We need to get closer to clients now. The do-it-yourself world is out there. We know it, we've seen it, we've experienced. The trends continue towards self-prepared tax returns. Through this past tax season, professionally prepared returns were pretty much flat, down 0.4%. Self-prepared returns were up 4.4%. I think what you should consider is just do the math. What's the increase in the volume of returns out there, and am I participating in it in my practice? After the fact really doesn't cut it anymore. We've got to get closer to clients today. We have to have that connection, and we have to deal with that connection in today's world. Bottom line is clients want more than just compliance. We've got to be agile and get closer and get better connected to our clients in a manner that they want us connected with them. Now I would tell you, I'm occasionally asked what keeps me up at night. What keeps me up at night is thinking about what you see on this slide here. Is 30 to 40% of accounting firms seem to be operating in a manner that does not align with today's world. It's out of sync. Now, I know this is not you. This is a progressive group. This is why you're here. You want to talk to your peers. You want to understand what it is they're doing, how they're operating their practices. But I'm going to give you some data, as I mentioned. 
provide some survey information from uh, the last several years about where accounting firms are. And if you're competing against some of them that seem to be lagging somewhat, then you're in a great spot. And the setup for this is I'll talk about what's referred to as the diffusion of innovations. A lot of people made money on this, but it's a concept that was initially um, pulled together about 50 years ago by a gentleman by the name of Everett Rogers, who said there's a simple adoption curve of innovations that occurs, and um, this example is in, you can compare it with any innovation whatsoever. We have our early adopters, we have our early majority, and once we hit about 50%, things start to slow down a little bit, and, and then the remainder of the consumers or whatever adopt that new technology. Some of the early part of my presentation, you could see the very quick ramp up in some areas like mobile, and that the curve is much compressed. You know, as I would say with accounting firms, we're more conservative in general, and it's much more spread out. And I'll give you examples of that. This chart um, shows several years here, and what I want you to focus on is the right-hand side, 2013, and what this chart illustrates, the question actually is, um, do you, what is the major method you use to send to 60% of your clients or more uh, tax returns back to your end client? And you can see the blue here is paper. We're still very much paper oriented with almost 74%. Up on the top, you can see portals. We're now at about 11%. Portals have specifically been designed for accounting firms have been available, ours was in a pilot in 2001, 2003, commercially available, but this is where overall the profession is. By the way, this is our UltraTax CS survey, which has a very large customer base. We get a great response from it. They're firms of all sizes in all regions. They're all over the country, so it's a, a, a pretty reliable source of information. And by the way, 29% of firms use portals for at least some of their clients for any data. Percentage of firms with websites. In this, responding to this survey, you can see not much movement. 46% was in 2007. We're still at about 60% today. 40% of accounting firms do not have a website. I would ask you, are they aligned with the world of today? Document management systems. Document management systems specifically designed for the accounting profession have been available since the late 90s. Ours was released in 1998. And you can see, again, not much movement. We're very slow. That last group, the, the laggards, or the late majority, actually, still out there, 35% without document management systems. Um, this is a relatively new area. There have been products available out there since about 2007. And this is the percentage of firms using um, OCR, or optical character recognition, and organize and fill. In other words, organizing source documents, um, which I've often referred to as a transitional technology. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where the data are available to us just to pick up. But this is a technology that allows us to organize data. I'm going to illustrate that in just a minute um, and be able to produce that uh, uh, data or have it come back to you actually read. Um, we think you see a huge jump here. We're still in the early, uh, or the, um, early minority here. Uh, with 17% from 7%, we think actually people misinterpreted the question. We think that it may very well be that they've got scanners and they say, do I utilize the PDF uh, OCR within the scanner? Um, that 17.7% I think is, is highly suspect. All right, 54% of firms have a wireless network. 53% of firms allow employees to log into the firm's network via personal devices. This is a bring your own device world. I mentioned that with respect to BlackBerry. People want to bring their own devices and have them connect up to our networks. Percentage of firm using web-based solutions, cloud solutions, and this is of any type, by the way, this is not just ours, are utilizing any web-based applications today. Products available, including ours since the late 90s, the yes responses to that were 16%. Very likely and likely, if we added that to the response rate, the yes would, would rise up to 26%. One of the things that I would tell you is we do this survey every single year, and the people that are in the very likely and likely categories don't necessarily actually move um, based upon how they've responded to this. In other words, they don't get there. 
Now, uh, in our customer base, the percentage of um, our users overall that are in the cloud, utilizing our cloud, cloud products, is about 13.4%, but it's not rising dramatically. It's, it's relatively, uh, relatively flat. A real eye-opener for us, by the way, was Windows XP, and I want to just ex explain this situation to you. I had our head of development, who happens to be out here, Brian Vroom, came into my office about six or eight months ago, and he said, John, we've got to decide what we're going to do about Windows XP. I said, well, you know, Brian, I said, I know the extended support ends, um, unfortunately, one week before the end of tax season in 2014. And I said, this is an ancient uh, operating system. Obviously, you know, you don't need to worry about the updates in the fall dealing with Windows XP. Now, you can probably tell I'm a data-driven person, so I said, let's be conservative. Let's actually look at the data. Now, overall, um, in the US, in October of 2012, Windows XP was in use on 16, roughly 16% 16 of um, desktops across the US. Um, much larger, by the way, globally, but in the US, that was the percentage. In response to our question, 36% indicated in the survey it's on all or most PCs in their accounting firms. We're very conservative in general with respect to new technology. All this reminds me of a quote that I love from William Gibson who said, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. You know, it's out there, it's available to us. We're just not all taking advantage of it. Now on the positive side, 67% of firms are using smartphones in their practice. By the way, uh, the percentage still using Blackberries. Uh, this survey goes out right at the end of tax season every single year. It was about 10%. If you recall, in January, uh, Blackberry usage was about 5%. Now it's about uh, 2 to 3%. Tablet use, as I mentioned, tablets are in use by about 38% of consumers overall. In firms, the usage rate is about 23%. The reality today is no website, no portals, no simultaneous access to client accounting systems, cloud, mobile. It's probably going to mean a diminishing client base and also retention issues within accounting firms and recruiting issues within accounting firms if they're not aligned with the world of today. Great news is, again, you're here at a conference with people that think like you. 48% of the firms attending the conference are using our cloud-based products, 63% of you are using our net client portals. Question I would ask of you all, or things that we can contemplate together here collectively, everything's changed since 2007. Have you reimagined your firm? All right, what's Thomson Reuters' role in all of this? When I talk about the, all those new technologies at the front end, obviously we've got to be up to date with that, understand what it means what we can provide for you, because our job is to provide innovative products and services to allow you to operate in today's world. We want to drive efficiency for, through workflow, and I'm going to illustrate that in just a minute here. And also, and probably most important today, is connect you to your clients using mobile in the cloud for simultaneous collaboration. That's where we think that connectivity to the client, um, once that's in play, that really locks them down with respect to their um, viewing your firm as providing the services they need. You're, you're operating in today's world. Why mobile? Just to reiterate what we said before, consumers are clients, they access their smartphones, 67% of small business owners view mobile as very, very important. All right, now I'm going to switch gears a bit here and, and actually demo some of our newer technology. And to do so, I'm going to do a little bit of a story with you. We're going to imagine that we're an accounting firm, a firm of Parnes, Volano Martinez, and you and your staff accountant, Linda Hunter, are serving a client named Green Oak Family Medicine. Now, as I illustrate um, this initial video that I'm going to show, you, uh, you are dealing with your client who is, who is on exactly the same product that you are in the web. In other words, they're operating with uh, accounting CS client version, which you have access to simultaneously. You can be in the application at exactly the same time. So Green Oak Family Medicine has just hired a new office manager, Deborah Thomas. Deborah will help run the office, pay bills, handle other functions, and Deborah is also a tax prospect. So Deborah hits your website to log in 
to our application. And she's going to go in, and one of the things we're going to illustrate here is a new capability that we have in payables. What we want to do is get Green Oak Family Medicine into a paperless office. I realize this is, um, I was going to say, difficult to see in the back, impossible to see in the back, so I apologize for that. But one of the new capabilities we want to illustrate here is the ability to actually attach an invoice specifically into a payable so that now we can drive Green Oak Family Medicine into a paperless office. And we have templates to set this up for periodic payments, et cetera. So that was that illustration. And she was going to do another example there, singular wireless. Now what we're going to do is um, we're going to actually illustrate payroll and some of the capabilities we have with Accounting CS now for batch processing of payroll. But what Deborah's going to do is she's going to go in, make an address change on one uh, particular employee, and then create her payroll for us. By the way, on the left-hand side here, you have set up what her capabilities are with respect to reporting, what types of things she can do, and you can control that so she doesn't, the client doesn't hurt themselves with respect to making changes that they shouldn't necessarily do. So now we've gone in, we've got a bi-weekly payroll here, and Deborah's gonna complete it. Okay, which she has done. Now the firm is notified, Linda Hunter, notified of the updates made by Deborah. She can verify Deborah's entries and this is where we'll illustrate the new capability we've got in Accounting CS of batch uh, processing payrolls. So let's take a look at that. We go in, we see um, Green Oak here. Now we're going to do our batch processing. We've clicked on that. We're going to print checks. And we have a complete payroll button now. Here's our payrolls, and you can see we have not only Green Oak Family Medicine, but a number of other clients on the same cycle. We select them all, complete payroll output, and there we go. We have it released, and we're going to print to portals, as well as if we need to phys physically print, we can do that also. So here we are, we've completed the batch process now. Now, Deborah, what I'm gonna illustrate is the, is the power of our portals relative to the fact that if we have an individual, that's a single individual that can handle multiple um, uh, requirements, being a personal client as well as a business client through the same portal. So what we will do here is we'll enter Practice CS. We have very, very tight integration with Practice CS, and you're going to sit in workshops, and I'm sure you're going to talk to our, our folks here in the support area about what capabilities we have with respect to integration. But we're going to put Deborah out here as a client. Very powerful reporting capabilities in Practice CS. So we're going to want to know where was that client referred to by, where did it come from, um, reputation in this example, Green Oak Family Medicine as the referral. And now, since we have Deborah set up as having a, her portal, all we've got to do is indicate that on the personal basis, she's dealing with us through that very same portal, which we just did. Right now, Deborah is going to go out and uh, access some payroll reports. And then, and this is a cool new feature we've got, drag and drop capabilities. She's going to send her tax documents out to us as well. So she goes in to Green Oak Family Medicine, takes a look at her payroll report, which she's received a notification on. There's the payroll report. She's going to look at her depository totals. There they are. And now we go into File Exchange. We're going to go in and we're going to upload a document, a PDF. So Deborah grabs it off her desktop, drags it into the portal, 
and uploads it. We now have Deborah's source documents in her portal. The next thing that's going to occur is Linda Hunter, back at the office, receives those source documents. She's going to bring them into a relatively new product we have. We released it uh, really this summer. We introduced the concept at last year's user conference, but a brand new capability for tax workflow called WorkPaper CS. So Linda's going to go out here now. She receives a notification of file exchange. So she goes into WorkPaper CS. She's now in the dashboard. And she goes out to the portal. She has to log in so she can gain access to it. And she drags and drops Deborah's source documents into now our tax workflow in WorkPaper CS. So now we have our source documents there. Drag and drop capability portal to our workflow product. And this is naturally assigned to Linda. There we have it. There are the source documents in our dashboard now, our tax workflow dashboard. Very exciting new capabilities that we've got. All right, the next thing that we'll do is we're actually going out, we're transmitting returns now for source document processing. So we've transmitted them. Now we're going to bring them back down. We've received them. Remember I talked about that organized capability? Within our source document processing, we have organized, put it in a sequence that we're familiar with, and then actually read the data and bring it into the tax return automatically. So there's a source document, so we're now going to organize them. And here you have it, all laid out, which by the way fits consistently with the input in UltraTax CS. There's the income items, we have retirement items, we have itemized deductions, all organized in a format that we can deal with. The next capability we have is to actually read that data and bring it into the UltraTax um, product itself. So Linda's going to complete the source data entry. Goes out and grabs the information from source data entry, brings it in to UltraTax CS. There we have it. The next step that can be done, and this is where we can actually separate administrative duties from professional duties, is we can have an admin person up front verify the data, just make sure it's 100% accurate. The OCR brought in automatically, and we're selecting that as an admin person, bringing it into the tax return. Next step for us is to actually go out, print that return, print it into our document management system, place it out on the portal automatically for Deborah Thomas to see. The next thing I'm going to illustrate is our mobile capabilities here. Deborah receives notification on her iPad letting her know is her tax return is ready for review. So she's sitting on a sofa at home, relaxing. By the way, I'm going without a net here, so uh, hopefully we'll be in good shape. So we're actually going to switch over so that you can See me with this information. Automat okay, we're bringing it up here. Let me get down just a touch. Hopefully we're reasonably well focused. So this is my iPad. I go into the CS Professional Suite. I go into Net Client CS. And now I log in as Debra. By the way, as I was uh, illustrating this to a couple of our people saying I'm going to cover this and I'm going to be Debra, they indicated to me, whoops that um, Deborah seemed like an attractive woman in the graphics, yet her hands are just atrocious. 
All right, so what, I, what I'm able to see here, by the way, first thing that you see is that it, this is, uh, if you saw NetClient from last year, we introduced NetClient at the conference last year. Totally branded to your firm, so you don't see anything from Thomson Reuters here. This is our firm, Parnes Bolano Martinez. We're iOS 7 compatible. We're moving all of our, our uh, mobile technology to iOS 7. Nice, clean look. They'll be familiar with it. And I'll just illustrate a couple things on the left-hand side here, and then we'll go in and do a, a couple of additional items. So I've got messages, um, which I can take a look at. This will bring them up automatically, a series of messages here. I've got um, an invoice out here somewhere. OK. You have a payroll worksheet available, new um, document for Deborah as well. All right, I've got news that I can put out there, my own news possibly. And we'll just bring up one news item that we had written. We'll get out of that, we'll go back. Now I've got other capabilities out here, but what I want to illustrate is I have on a single portal now, Green Oak Family Medicine, since Deborah is the office manager, and also her individual uh, documents as well. So if I quickly look at Green Oak Family Medicine, I can see my accounting reports. I can see a number of other items out here as well. But there's my financial statement off of the portal. I can also see tax returns here. I'll quickly go into one. Oops. Here's the last year's tax return. There's the 1120S, all off of my mobile device. And now what I want to do is actually take a look at uh, Deborah. So we have completed her tax return. If you recall, we did that. We can look at her tax return here. We've sent her a draft. Um, we also can send her a document to sign prior to that. But here's a draft of her tax return. We sent it out for her to take a look at. And she has remembered, by the way, gosh, I forgot an item on my tax return. And this is the really cool part, OK? We now can go into File Exchange. And if you recall, she sent us that PDF through her portal. So here it is. There are her tax documents all out there in the portal. But in addition to that, she forgot a 1099. So what she can actually do with our technology, we totally integrate. We realize everything is in the cloud these days. She hits this little plus button. We now can be integrated with Dropbox. So she's taken a photo of her 1099, sitting there on her couch, photo of her 1099. She's got it in Dropbox. We now go out to Dropbox. And we'll go out to our update here. Here's the 1099 picture. There it is. It's almost not worth it. She forgot 100 bucks here. But we want to bring it in. And if you can see down here, we've got upload. Now imagine what's occurring. Her image is in the cloud, in Dropbox. We're now going to take that. We're going to upload it to her portal. So you can see uploading to file exchange. And there it is. Here's that 1099. This was real time. I did that just in the amount of time it took me to uh, pull that up. So that is uh, mobile or net client mobile. So you can take a look at that while you're out here. I would suggest that you do. I'm just simply going to sign out. And now we'll continue, and we'll wrap things up. That's pretty cool stuff, huh? We think so. All right, what about tax uh, workflow incorporating our cloud lockbox? We do not have this today, but I want to just tell you in the next couple of minutes where we're headed. Now, if you imagine overall workflow now with all the technology capabilities you have at your fingertips, what can occur is the client's going to capture source documents year-round. You know they get um, contribution statements on a year-round basis. They can take pictures of them. We can OCR that information. Documents can be stored all year long in a lockbox. At year-end, you send a client organizer out to them. Client completes the questionnaire all electronically. Firm gets notified that's done. You'll utilize all the tools at your disposal, including work paper, CS, complete the tax return, notification goes out to the end client for a signature, client signs the documents, invoice notification goes out, invoice received and paid all through the system, 
and then a tax return is filed and delivered to the client. What the questionnaire might look like, this is a simple illustration on a smartphone, a little different design by the time we hit a, uh, an iPad. Signing documents and sim simply going to be through the use of, of a finger, acceptance of it. Again, um, we've got that capability, by the way, in engagement letters currently, or we're headed, al we're almost completed there. And hopefully when the IRS gets to that point, you'll be able to deal with it that way. Invoice would be received, automatically paid, totally integrated with Practice CS, tax return delivered on any device through net client. Where we are on our overall mobile apps, so we've got net client CS, and you can see on the left-hand side, Parnes Volano Martinez. We also have the capability, those of you that are um, referring accountants for MyPay Solutions, we have a mobile app there as well for end clients. Um, and of course, we have Mobile CS, which was our initial mobile product released a few years ago, fully integrated with Practice CS. So bottom line, it's a very, very fast-paced world today. Technological changes are accelerating. I think we all understand that. And we've got to be aligned with that. The cloud, mobile, converging technologies, even demographics, I've changed how we live our daily lives. We have to make sure that's aligned with our practices. It's effect, affected every area of your practice. I want you to feel comfortable that you've got a partner. This is what we're here for in knowing that Thomson Reuters is here to, to help. We'll build those innovative technologies to allow you to operate your firm totally align, aligned with the world of today. Be agile accordingly. Now again, I know it's a great time to be an accountant today, especially with all these fun, cool technology tools. What I ask you to do is think about what I've said today and get on that front side of that technology distribution. Be part of the future. Be a firm that's dealing in today's world. Be an apple, not a Blackberry. And reimagine your firm. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference.